Would you open your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. <clears throat> this is Jesus' fourth letter to the seven churches in Revelation. It's to a city that's known as Thyatira. It's a little hard for people to say in English. You kind of get your tongue wrapped around your teeth on that one. But Thyatira was actually a city that was called a protectorate city. Now, this is a background that you need to know. The people that lived in Thyatira knew that they were expendable. How would you like to be that? Where you're living may call upon you someday to flee for your lives or lay down your lives for another city that's some 25 to 30 miles away, the one we talked about last week, Pergamum. Thyatira existed for one purpose only, to slow down an attacking army that was coming to hit Pergamum, because Pergamum was the city. It was a big one, and it was important. It was vital. Thyatira, they were the expendables. So here they set up a city, and it becomes a city at some very seriously important crossroads of trade, and so you've got a whole lot of people living in the city who are artisans because they trade with the caravans coming through from Europe, Africa, Asia, and Arabia that all come through a little twisted knot of, of roads that come right through that little city. And the tradesmen there, they make idols, they make bronze, they make textiles, they dye things purple. Remember Lydia from Philippi? Remember her? Paul runs into her at the, in, in, in Philippi, and she's, in a sense, she's the Macedonian man that was crying out, come over here, the vision that Paul had. And the first person he runs into is a woman from, uh, from the, the area of Asia Minor, where she's from, from Thyatira. And she's a seller of purple because there's this little plant called a matter root. It's matter. It's a matter root, M-A-D-D-E-R. It's got these roots. You can smash them down, and it makes this purple dye. And it's very valuable. It's very expensive. And she has obviously done very well with it. She travels as a merchant, and she ends up in Philippi, and she's the first convert to Christianity in Europe when Paul goes over to Philippi. She's from Thyatira. So she's making this very expensive cloth, and she does it there. Thyatira is full of all these tradespeople, and they formed trade guilds, which read in modern English, unions. And every one of these people, whether they're the bronze workers or the coppersmiths or the idol makers, or, and those are often combinations of that, or weavers and, and uh, uh, dyers and that sort of a thing, they all had their own little trade guilds and their own little unions. Now, why am I telling you this? Because if you don't understand that, you will never understand what's going on in his letter. The trade guilds had patron gods and goddesses. In other words, you got this trade union, this trade guild, and in order to make sure that they do really well, that they prosper, they bring a god on board, an idol, and they put all their trust in a particular idol or maybe more than one idol. And then they would have their business meetings and they would talk about how they're going to expand their, their, the reach of their trades and all of this. And then they would have a worship service. And the worship services with these idols were a combination of very heavily laden with meat feasts, and meat was rare back then, and orgies. Yeah, not a very proper thing to talk about on Sunday morning, but that happened to be the fact because that is in part how idol worships, worshipers worship their idols. And nothing had changed when it came to the trade guilds. They were like, in a sense, and I mean this in a respectful way, but you get the idea, like the elks or the moose, lodges like that. And then, you know, there's a, some of these organizations actually do host a lot of drinking. Well, these people hosted a lot of other things that were far worse than that. That's what the trade guilds were all about. 
Now, if you understand this, let's take a look at this letter. Verse 18, chapter 2. The smallest city, the most insignificant city of all the cities listed here of the seven churches to Revelation, and yet the longest letter from Jesus, who has the lamp burning before the throne in heaven, as it were. Remember, he is the glorified Lord, is the way he portrays himself speaking this letter. This isn't some guy in a ragged suit with brown hair and a beard looking rather, you know, weathered from what he's been doing. This is the risen, glorified, exalted Jesus with hair white as wool, face shining like the sun, eyes piercing through that, that brilliance of his face, the robe going down to his feet, the golden sash across his chest, his feet. Interestingly enough, burning like bronze in a furnace, which trades guildmen would understand that very well. And he dictates a letter with all that glory, all that power, all that force of his godhood to this church that is doing some things very well and some things really, really bad. He said, To the angel in the church of Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, whom whose feet are like burnished brass. I know your deeds, your love, and your faith, your service, and your perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Oh, you've got some good things going for you. We'll come back to this. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. This is Jesus. That's powerful. I will strike her children dead. And then all the churches, not just you, Thyatira, will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you, only hold on to what you have until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. And then he quotes from Psalm 2. He will rule them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thyatira. They're in trouble. Pergamum was in trouble because of the pressure that was being put on from the outside, from the community, from Rome, from the emperor, from the magistrates, where they were saying, worship Caesar, worship our gods, or we will boycott you, we will cancel you, we might even kill you. This, on the other hand, which sounds, when you read it, very much like what Jesus says to the people in Pergamum is different, radically different, because their problem isn't coming from outside pressure. Their problem is coming from inside the church. It's got gangrene, and it's starting to make its way through the whole congregation. Now, Jesus begins. Let's go back up to the beginning of the letter. To the angel in the third, at the church of Thyatira, write. These are the words of the Son of God. Right there, he declares his own godhood. Remember, if you've ever heard people say, and I still hear it often enough, Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God. Right there, in writing his own words, I am the Son of God. 
the same stuff as God, the same, he's the inheritor of all the things of God, not that God is going to die. It's a term where he, where he has everything that his father has. It's not that God's going to die and he's going to get it. He already has it. The son of God, same stuff as the son of God, same blood as God, same stuff as God, same DNA as God, as it were. He is one with the father. He knows the Father. He's inseparable from the Father. He is not a creation. He wasn't born. Some people in some cults say that Jesus was born because he calls himself the firstborn. That's foolishness. They don't know the scripture and they certainly don't know Greek or culture. A firstborn is a title, not that a person was born first, but a firstborn is a title whereas that person in the family is the prime inheritor from the father and gets everything that the father gives. That's the one, the number one son, as it were. That's why, for instance, as we've talked about here before, when we sing that song at the end of our service, that behold what manner of love the father has given unto us, that we should be called the sons of God. Ladies, don't take offense at that. Women didn't get inheritances, and you're called the sons of God. It's not a slight on your gender. It's an elevation to say that women get the inheritance right along with the men that God gives. But Jesus is our older brother. He is as the firstborn, and he gets the full inheritance from God, as it were. So he's the son of God, and he is God, and he wants them to know this, whose eyes are like blazing fire, I have the right to judge because I can see right through you. I can see what's happening in your church. I can see the good. I can see the bad. I can see where you have strayed and where you have ignorantly gone wrong and where you have deliberately disobeyed. I know the whole thing. I know the motives. And whose feet are like burnished or glowing brass or bronze in a fire. Stands on judgment. And these people who were trades guildsmen understood this because most of them were, again, metal workers and blacksmiths and that sort of thing. They knew this. So Jesus says, my feet are like glowing bronze, and he's barefoot. So what's the deal with that? Well, according to the Greeks and their traditions, that if you ever see, and you can see this, you ever see a statue, a Greek statue, not a Roman one so much, Perhaps, but that really doesn't count. Greek statues. And the individual is wearing no shoes. They're considered divine by the Greeks. Thyatira is a Greek city. And so Jesus said, once again, I'm God. I'm talking here. I can see right through you. Don't look for loopholes. I'm seeing right through them. Don't make any excuses. I can see right through that, and I'm burning holes in it. There are no loopholes. And if you try and song and dance, you're not going to get away with it. Not because I will figure it out. Because I already know. He says, I know your deeds. We've talked about this so many times. Don't forget your works in this world as a Christian are vital. They do not buy your salvation. They do not secure your salvation. They come as a result of your salvation, which is why if you are saved, a person who is saved stops doing evil and starts doing good and continues to do good. And, of course, I love it with the way John put it, who actually said these things in so many words and very, very boldly. He also said, but if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the righteous. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But I wanted to tell you that so that you don't walk out of here feeling condemned. But it's still not a loophole to say that I'll try and do good to the best of my ability, and when I sin, hey, I sinned. No, we do what we do now as unto the Lord. And that is our purity before the world. And our purity, as it were in an ancient wedding, is the veil that the bride wears until she is united with the bride on the day that he comes to take her away. Our purity 
is our veil, Bride of Christ, and it tells the entire world that I belong to someone not of this world. So we do good. We keep our lives pure. We perform by the power, by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you'd never be able to do it. Works that God approves of. And in the end, we know that I really didn't do them anyway. He did them in me, and he did them through me. And yet, he gives us the reward as if we had done them all by ourselves. And that's remarkable. But isn't that just like grace? And so, he said, I know your deeds, your love, and your faith. Your love. You love one another. And remember, loving one another isn't sentiment. It's action. Loving one another isn't based on how you feel about each other. It's about giving and doing for others as God would give and do to them as he gave and did to you. Which is, again, glorious. What if God treated us as our sins deserved? Oh, there'd be little piles of ashes all over this room. Nobody would be breathing. But God didn't treat us as our sins deserve. And when we love one another, we don't treat each other as their sins deserve. Or perhaps even as how a brother or sister, even in this room perhaps, outside this room perhaps, another church or another country has sinned against us. We treat them as Jesus treated us. Our love for one another. That's how we love one another. I know your deeds and your love, your faith. You're hanging in there. You trust. You trust me. You followed me and you follow me solidly. I know these things. Your service. They're serving. Like our food closet. Like those who serve around the church here. Our deacons, our elders, uh, everybody. I, I love our church so much. You guys, you're amazing. And I'm, I'm not flattering you because I, I can brag to other churches and other pastors who say that 10% of the people in the church do 100% of the work. Hey, the church is not keeping up the building. The church is keeping up each other. And in that sense, especially in that sense, much less the maintenance of things around here and taking care of stuff, that I would say at least 90% of the people in this entire congregation do 100% of the work. You know what that tells you? The Holy Spirit is working here through each of us. As I've said the last two Sundays that I've spoken, whenever two Christians meet, there is an exchange of gifts because that's what the Holy Spirit does. It's a remarkable thing. You have also, like the church at Thyatira, I think better altogether, but let me just say this much anyway, that your service and your perseverance is so good because you've served and you've hung in there. And you've hung in there through thick and thin. And Jesus tells this to the church at Thyatira. And it's such a good thing. And then he says, I know that you are now doing more than you did at first. You're growing in these things. You started off well. A lot of people start well and they sprint and then they realize I'm running out of air here. i got to slow down. They started off and they just kept on going. And they're doing better. And they're doing better. And they're doing better. But here's the rub. And I want to qualify everything that I say next with this. This is why, at least here, at this church, we preach Jesus. And we will preach and teach the Scripture and the truth, knowing that the world will not like it, knowing that it can invite big problems from the world. It can invite big problems from within the congregation, should there be people that suddenly disagree vehemently with some things that are said for various reasons which are addressed right here in the letter to the church at Thyatira. Here's what Jesus said. 
Nevertheless, but beware when Jesus says, but I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. Stop right there. The operative word here is tolerate. Now, that word in the English language, especially in a Bible-believing, Christ-following church, is problematic. Because to the world, it's hypocrisy. To us, it's a very, very discerning line that we have to relate to. What do I mean by this? That we, as Christians, towards all people everywhere, are to be the most tolerant people in the world. But, here's the line, we do not tolerate sin. Jesus demonstrated this perfectly on so many occasions. And you can think of them. Probably they're running through all of your heads right now. You've got the V1. Jesus ate with sinners, tax collectors, and other bad people. But he never approved of what they did. But eating with them, he was, well, we would use a very popular term, identifying with them. But it's more than that. He was saying, you're with me. I'm with you, but I will not do what you do, ever. I'm apart from sin, but you are welcome to be part of me. Because that's what happened when you ate with people. There are people in this world, who every time I read the news, who make me bristle. Usually every time I read the news, it's somebody new, somebody different. I read an article this morning, and I went, how could a human brain come up with that nonsense? <laughs> insanity. And the insanity continues, and the insanity grows on social and cultural and political levels. Not just in our country. Realize it's every country in the world. Everybody's got their problems. Everybody does. But culturally, politically, how could people think and do what they do? And then my adrenaline begins to pump. And then I start thinking bad thoughts like, God, you need to kill these people. <laughs> I say that very facetiously. Of course not. But you know what I mean. Get them out of here. Do some, rapture them. I don't know. Do something. <laughs> on our prayer list, we have on there, please pray for our government officials. And my flesh wants them gone replaced. You know what God wants? He wants them saved. How should you pray for them? Lord, don't replace them. Save them. They'd do a whole lot more good if they were. Now listen, tolerance is an interesting thing because there are a lot of bad people in this world and we do not have to tolerate what they do bad. But how will we ever get them saved if we push them away? God, as I remind you, and will continually remind us all, is constantly bringing people in, wanting to bring people in. God is not, capitalize, underline, highlight, italicize, the word not, willing that any should perish. Any is any and all. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all, how much is all? all. That all should come to repentance. That includes the worst people on earth and the people that have the most divergent, disgusting ideas in the world. We do not tolerate their ideas. We do tolerate them as human beings that God wants to save, even when you don't like them. And how do you differentiate between the two? No bones about it. It's hard. It's not easy. And to preach this and teach this simply tells you how difficult it must have been for Jesus while he walked this earth. Being God, he has definitely an extreme advantage in this. But I think even so, the grief that he must experience, 
knowing that the people that he is desiring to save and sit down and eat with, he also knows that if they don't repent, he's going to have to condemn them to hell, which is not what he wants to do. He's not willing that any should perish. So the operative word here is tolerate. And in the church, they're doing the bad part of tolerating. They are tolerating things that God said no. They're tolerating things that God said that is an abomination to me. They're tolerating things that God specifically commanded you must not do this. And Jesus is God and he's writing the letter. He said, you tolerate that woman Jezebel. Now, I, I, I reluctant to do this, but it made a whole lot of sense. And it, if it, I don't want to rub anybody politically the wrong way, no matter where anybody stands, even watching on YouTube. But the way Jesus phrased this sounds an awful lot like what Bill Clinton said when he was talking about Monica Lewinsky. When he said, I did not have relations with that woman. That's a distancing tact in the language to say, push her away, even though she was intimate with him. With Jesus, he's saying, you tolerate that woman. And that kind of gives us a sense of what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, she is not with me, except the president lied, and Jesus tells the truth. She's not with me. They were tolerating her as if she somehow was, that she somehow represented Jesus, was sent by him, perhaps speaking for him, speaking the truth of the scripture. And Jesus says, you tolerate that woman. Right there, the Thyatirans must have gone white. <sighs> Who calls herself a prophetess. This tells us something. The Thyatirans believe that she spoke for God. Now, we've talked about prophets and prophetesses a lot. Prophets and prophetesses are people that the Bible describes as speaking forth the word of God. They're not considered so much Bible teachers, but they tell you what God meant when he said something in the scripture. You say there's kind of a gray area in there, and there is. There's a lot of things that make it difficult in our society to define what a prophet is. But just think of it in terms of a person who tells you what's on God's mind. And there are people in this world that fit those categories. There are women who fit those categories. You find prophetesses, as we've said, prominent in the Old Testament and some in the New. And they were admired by the churches and listened to as long as they were true. But Moses put stipulations on prophets, including prophetesses, that they have to tell the truth all the time. Another time, he said if they predict something, their prediction has to come true or you don't listen to them. If they are saying they're speaking for me and they're not speaking for me, God told Moses, send them outside the camp and kill them. Stone them to death. That's serious stuff. God doesn't want himself misrepresented. Now, this is not anything to us. If you find a false prophet, go out and kill them. Once again, we don't do that. We're not disobeying the laws of Moses. Those are the laws of Moses for the people of Israel at the time. We are not that. And we are not doing anything like that. Remember, Jesus, what would he do? But wait a minute. He does know how to take care of business. He takes care of it. We let him do that. She calls herself a prophetess. She is tolerated. She is not with Jesus. And she claims to speak for him. She claims to speak for God. And they bought it. By her teaching, she misleads my servants. I'm glad Jesus didn't just say people. My servants. She is in the church. She is infecting the church. And 
the servants of Jesus. That is a very, very good word from God to call any one of his followers a servant. Jesus was a servant. He taught us how to be servants. So you're a servant. And he says, you are my servants in the church. But she is misleading my servants. Jesus is very protective of his servants. You're serving the Lord? He's very protective of you. And if somebody starts to mislead you, one of his servants, believe me, whether you see it or not, whether you discern it or not, he is going to step in and correct that. And he will go to whatever measure he needs to do to make sure that you're kept safe or at least warned. She misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. She's leading God's people in Thyatira into idol worship. Plain and simple, that's it. You say, well, why would they do that? They're Greeks. They had the gospel preached to them. They were idol-worshipping pagans, worshipping a pantheon of gods. And now they follow Jesus. They have a lot to unlearn because they weren't Jews who became messianic. They were pagans who became messianic. And they, before the gospel was preached, probably didn't even know what a Messiah was, probably rarely, if ever, heard of a Sabbath unless they had exposure to the Jews, didn't know what Ten Commandments were and couldn't name one of them. And now they're Christians. And they're in this Greek city. And in comes this person, Jezebel. Whether that's her real name or not, we don't know. But it's not a kind name. And she begins to promote idol worship in the church. And the Greeks who are doing more than they did, in other words, they're growing slowly, but they're growing, are suddenly awakened to the idea that, oh, this is the Christian God, and we follow the Christian God, but our other gods still count. So maybe we should worship them too. And besides, from a very worldly, sensuous standpoint, their gods are often a lot more fun than our God. But there's a price to pay. Now that sounded like a terrible thing, but it's not. Because, frankly, you can imagine, as I've said before, the idolatrous worship practices of the pagans in ancient times must have been invented by men because they involve so much temple prostitution where if you want to worship a particular god, you go to the temple and you enlist a temple prostitute and the rest uh, you can leave up to your own study. And that's exactly what this person Jezebel was promoting. Is that really her name? Well, it fits. Even if it wasn't, it's very descriptive. Because if you go back into 1 Kings towards the end of the book and the beginning of 2 Kings all the way up to chapter 9, this woman Jezebel was the worst most wicked king of Israel, it was his wife. She was a Sidonian woman who he married, and she was an idol-worshiping pagan, and she was evangelistic in her paganism. She brings prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth into the palace at Ahab's palace. And there she has what the Bible describes as great feasts with all of these particular priests, which are massive, again, forgive me, a PG-13 sermon, but they are massive pagan orgies. And she brings this into Israel, and Ahab just goes along with it. This is why Elijah contested the prophets of Baal there on Mount Carmel, and God burned up and accepted Elijah's offering where he did absolutely nothing to the offering presented to Baal. And when God burned up miraculously that offering on Elijah's altar, then Elijah went out and summarily executed all these priests down at the Kishon Brook in the Jezreel Valley, which is today the Valley of Armageddon. And Jezebel became furious and said, I'll kill that man. 
She loved her priests. She loved her idol worship, and she brought it into the kingdom of God at that time, the people of Israel. And she brought it to the people, and the people followed because their God was fun. Baal, you pleased him. You pleased Ashtoreth by doing immoral things, by feasting on meat sacrificed to idols. What's the deal with that? What's wrong with that? As we've said before, Acts 15, the council at Jerusalem, the Gentiles are coming into the faith. And the question is, what do we tell them? Do they have to become Jews before they become Christians? Do they have to keep the law, be kosher, and get circumcised? No. The council decided, send them a letter and tell them, don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. Don't eat meat with the blood still in it. Don't drink blood and uh, blood of animals. And don't commit sexual immorality. And many people have mistaken this for the council at Jerusalem somehow sliding the Gentiles back under kosher laws, which God wouldn't approve of, but it had nothing to do with that. They were simply telling the Gentiles, stop acting like pagans. Pagans do that, don't do that anymore. Here comes Jezebel. Meat sacrifice to idols, sexual immorality. And meat sacrifice to idols involved sacrificing animals with the blood still in it and drinking their blood. So you've got all four of them happening here, only though two were mentioned. This is what Jezebel, who's leading this church back into idolatry the way the real Jezebel led Israel into idolatry, and they didn't recover from it, by the way. And now this woman is doing the same thing. And Jesus says, you don't know what you've got going on here, and I am enlightening you, and you'd better pay attention because you are tolerating her. You're saying it's okay for her to be in the church and teach these things. You have some people in the church that disagree. But the people that are in the church and disagreeing, evidently, they're not going along with it, but they're letting her stay there. And they're letting her do this stuff. This is why here at least... We must stay the course and teach what the Scripture teaches and do what Jesus says. This is why we tolerate bad sinners but do not tolerate sin. We cannot. And we're not sin sniffers and flesh finders like the Pharisees would go trying to find people sinning so they could punish them. That's not our job. But our job is keeping the church pure. Our job is saying we will stay the course with Jesus. And it is the job of the shepherds of the church to make sure that false teaching is not brought in, that idol worship isn't brought in to, to contaminate what's going on. Here's what I find in modern churches. How about today? The more I read, the more I see, not on things like Facebook, but on legitimate Christian news sites that aren't extreme and aren't way out there into conspiracies and nonsense like that, the church more and more is complaining about immorality, which is good. They're doing it in the light of the abortion arguments and all of that. And still these same churches are preaching there are many ways to heaven. Folks, i got news for you. That's Jezebel. The church is outraged about things like abortion and, and gender identity nonsense, which is a denial of physical, empirical fact. But they certainly aren't outraged about feng shui or Eastern meditation being practiced within churches. This happens more and more frequently. That's Jezebel. We love God's word absolutely. But unfortunately, so many churches love the novelties of things like Bible codes and hidden messages in Scripture and pop psychology. That's Jezebel. It's about confusion sown among church leadership and the abandonment of foundational biblical truth in the church where Jesus is truly the dictatorial authority in the church. It is his church. It's not ours to interpret. It's not our church to add to anything that he has established. We stick with what he said. It's simple that way. And it's not confused. And yet, 
Congregations tend to put pressure on the leadership, but we like it this way. Can't we have it this way? I have news here too. The church was never a democracy. It, Jesus was never elected, and he can never be fired. It's his church. I will build my church, he said. And we, as his church, and as church leaders for that matter, cannot oppose him while intending to represent him and yet not pay a terrible price for it. Not because he's vengeful, but because we would be misrepresenting him, and that would be the greatest sin of all. You may remember Moses. When the children of Israel were grumbling in the wilderness and about to revolt because they didn't have water, and God told Moses, take your staff, go out and find this big rock, and smack it with the staff. Water will pour forth from the rock. And you got to remember, this is a lot of water. We're talking about a million people plus their animals. This isn't like a little trickle. This is like the confluence and then some. Big. And he smacks the rock and water comes out. Later on, same thing happens again. The people forgot the former miracle. They're wandering in the wilderness. And they're pouring out their complaints to Moses. They're about ready to revolt. Moses goes in and talks to the Lord and says, Lord, the Lord says to Moses, in essence, we've done this before. Now go out and talk to the rock. So Moses goes out and says, must we strike this rock a second time? And he smacks the rock with his staff. Water gushes out. People drink. And God says to Moses, come here. We need to have a little talk. And God told Moses, because you didn't do what I said, you didn't speak to the rock, instead you hid it a second time, you will lead this people through the wilderness, but you will not enter the promised land because they need to know how serious a violation you just did. Doing what? Hit the rock a second time? What's the big deal with that? Wasn't that he hit the rock the second time? Is that he used one word that changed everything. The word we. Must we strike this rock a second time? And he brought God into his misrepresentation of God as being angry with them. You speak to the rock. Just say, rock, bring forth water. And it would have happened. Instead, he demonstrated an anger that God did not have with his people, and he brought God in on his own anger by using that term, we. And God said, you misrepresented me, you can't go in. The people need to know I wasn't mad at them. Misrepresenting God has serious consequences for leadership. And it may be one of the greatest sins of all. So here you have Jezebel. Jezebel is working with the church. The church is involved in trade guilds. Remember, everybody in the church is somehow attached to these trade guilds, and it's of them to worship pagan gods at the trade guild meetings. Once they're done with the meeting, then they have their feast. They have their, again, forgive me, their orgies and what have you to enlist the favor of the gods upon their trade so that they would prosper and they would earn their money and they would get a great living from this. Now this is happening in the church. And the people in the church, no doubt, no doubt, belong to these trade guilds. This is what they're used to doing. Jezebel introduced what they're used to doing in the church. Jesus is our God, but we want the favor of the gods because we're all in this same thing. We all have to keep the same living. So let's do the same stuff. And she says, God says it's okay. She's a prophetess. She speaks for God. She says, Jesus said she calls herself a prophetess, which means she's got nothing to do with me. I didn't speak. She set out to contradict the truth, perhaps because she believed that Jesus was merely the Christian God. Don't make the other gods mad. Perhaps because 
will fit in better with the community. Perhaps because somebody put pressure on her, I doubt it, but it's possible, to say, hey, get this into the church, we'll have more favor with people, and we'll attract more people to the church if we just do these idolatrous things. We'll just attract more people. Jesus said, you stay the course. The narrow road is still the only road. Well, verse 21. I love this. Jesus said about Jezebel, I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she's unwilling. When somebody sins, a big sin, we need to deal with it. Now, that's another Bible study, and it's done in a way that often we have the wrong idea about. That kind of is dangling a carrot out there, isn't it? But the truth is that Jesus is extremely fair and very gentle, but very firm in how he deals with sin, especially in people's lives. Here, you have a person who is a really big sinner. She's a leadership in the church. Prophets were ex respected like pastors, like apostles. They were up there. They were respected in huge ways. And she's respected in the church, and she claims to be speaking for God, which is a huge sin, and she's not speaking for God. She's leading people into idol worship, which is a huge sin. Second commandment, breaking that one all over the place. Sexual immorality, she's breaking more commandments of God right there. And God, God lets her for a while. He doesn't just bring the hammer down on her because he wants her, listen, to repent. He doesn't want to destroy her. He doesn't want to wipe her out. He doesn't want to wipe out the followers of her or the children of her, as it were, those followers who are beginning to live like her and carry on her message, sort of has her spiritual DNA in their body. He doesn't want to do any of that. I want her to repent. You don't like what's going on in the church. You don't like what's going on in the government. You don't like what's going on in your family. God wants them to repent. So pray for the repentance. You don't like what the governor's doing or the president's doing or somebody else? Pray for their repentance. God is giving them time to repent. Why are they staying in there? Because God's giving them time to repent. Aren't you glad he did that with you? Or you wouldn't be here either. Neither would I. Boy, he cut us so much slack, not on sin, but on time. But she is unwilling. She had crossed that threshold one too many times, like Pharaoh. Hardening his heart, hardening his heart, hardening his heart, hardening his heart. God hardened his heart. God hardened his heart. God hardened his heart. He crossed a threshold. She had crossed that threshold. She's unwilling. So then Jesus says, I will cast her on a bed of suffering. Whatever that meant, to the Thyatirans, it was terrifying. And it was coming. And it was coming for Jezebel, this woman. And I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. Unless they repent of her ways. Jesus cuts them slack. He's wise. His eyes are flames of fire. It burns right through the, the intentions and the motives of a person's heart. He looks in and he says, you have followed her ways, her ways. They haven't fully become your ways. Repent of them. She brought it on. You believed her. Stop it. Those are her ways. They are not my ways. But if you continue to follow her, you'll suffer with her, whatever that meant. And that was definitely an ultimatum. Jesus gives ultimatums. Remember that. He is still in charge. All that we know of him, his gentleness, his love, his respect, but his standing on the truth because he is the truth. He cannot deny himself, much less anything he says. And therefore, he gives her time. She doesn't use the time. And those who follow her, they also need to repent, and he's giving them them time too. But he also gives them the ultimatum. And then he describes what he means. I will strike 
her children dead. Spiritual death? No doubt. Physical death? You never know. Have you read 1 Corinthians 11 lately? 10 and 11? Where in Corinth, they were partying with the elements of communion, making a mockery of them. And Paul comes right out and he says, that's why some of you have fallen asleep, which means they were Christians, but they died as a result of their disrespect of God. Is that a threat? It's an ultimatum. That's for sure. And God will stand behind it because he doesn't lie and he doesn't exaggerate. Is this strong stuff or what? Because this is written to the church. This is written to people in the church. This is written to leaders within the church and teachers and people that allow or promote people that come into the church that have messages that God might be utterly opposed to. I will strike her children dead, he says in verse 23, and then all the churches will know this is not just for Thyatira. It's for all the rest of the seven churches and all the churches for all time. And as you can tell, thinking over church history, there are a lot of churches and denominations that completely forgot about this verse. Then all the churches will know that I am Am, oh, there's a loaded sentence. He who searches hearts and minds, I know your motives. I know what you're doing. You can't talk your way out of this. You have to deal with it. And I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now, I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. I will not impose any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. There are a remnant of people in Thyatira that have not bought into Jezebel. But they're still tolerating her. She's there. They haven't done anything about it. Look at how Jesus talks to them. Hang on to what you've got. You get rid of this lady. You hang on to what you've got because you're doing all right there. You're doing just fine there. And oh, don't, don't hang on to any deep secrets. Why do you have a Bible in your hand? Because God is revealing. He is not hiding. He gave you the Bible not to confuse you, he gave you the Bible not to play riddle games with us. He gave you the Bible not for you to defer it to theologians to try and figure out these deep, complicated thoughts. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation was written to common people and most often to peasants who couldn't even read or write. And they understood every word of it. They didn't run around going, this is confusing, this is deep. They got it. That's why I love teaching the Word, because I got the best job in the world. I get to make the Bible simple again. Because the simpler it gets, the more profound it gets. Because the message is powerful, and it's right in our faces. But we treat it as if it's a confusing book. And it never was. We just make it that way. And there are those who come along and say, I have found these deep secrets. I remember one guy who claimed to be a theologian years ago. Who had a, uh, he'd get up at a blackboard and he would put these mathematical equations about God, quantifying God and showing how he worked mathematically. And it was like some sort of a quantum physics equation. And I'm looking at that going, man, God is really deep. I don't understand him. And then I realize, what nonsense, what good is that going to do anybody? We're going to walk away going, isn't God deep, but not knowing what he meant? Or how deep? Or what's really going on there? The Bible is a revelation. It's not a hiding. And she was teaching it as if the deep things of God, if you plunge deep enough, I will help you understand these deep secrets. Have you known people like this? I have. Have you heard of people like this? They're all over YouTube. 
They've got these deep secrets of God. There's one guy who gets up there, drives me crazy. I talk about him every time we do a prophecy update. Probably shouldn't give him the time of day. But he's a young guy with a beard, a white shirt, and a tie, and he's got a whiteboard behind him, and he gives you a mathematical theorem of how he can prove Jesus is coming back this year. And he's done it every year. <laughs> but it's the deep things of God. And I can tell you truly, on the authority of Scripture, that he is a false prophet. Do not tolerate guys like that or their message. They need to get saved. Well, they might be saved. Fine. Then they need to repent. This is stern stuff. But the people were told, hang on to what you've got. And the other people were told here, stop being a pagan. How has this affected the church today? There's something that we've talked about at the men's study. Dave has brought it up several times, and it's a word that I don't want you to glaze over when I say this word, so lean into it a little bit, okay? It's a fancy word called syncretism. And all that means is it's a blending of the truth of the Scripture with pagan beliefs or philosophical beliefs and kind of you're making a, a, a soup and you're piling in all kinds of things that aren't in the recipe and that will ruin the soup. Syncretism or synchronizing with other religions, other philosophies, other cultic beliefs. In our world, and even in our church, it's shown up with statements like, and I've heard this from churches, it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. That's a lie. It's all the same God. That's a lie. The Bible says so. All roads lead to God. That's a half-truth. All roads lead to God at the judgment seat, but not all roads lead to heaven. All religions are the same. That shows a gross misunderstanding and lack of education about religions in this world. You have different religions because they're different, radically different. Or this one, I've heard excessively in so many churches, all truth is God's truth. Therefore, if something is true, even if it's not in the Bible, then it must be for me, must be for us. Not so. Or if it works, it must be of God. That's utilitarianism. Or we're all big, one happy family. We're going to be okay. But after stern warnings and even ultimatums given to his churches, Jesus says, that spiritual and moral compromise with the pagans is unacceptable to him, and he will have words with that church and their leaders. Spiritual and moral compromise within the churches even today. Trendy stuff, meditation, yoga, crystals, astrology. You say astrology, Christians don't do that. You ever seen all the books on blood moons? And Jesus hasn't come back yet. That's a problem, folks. Ancestor worship. Say, what? We don't do ancestor worship. The Bible, I, I don't want to disappoint you, and I don't want to rub you the wrong way, but please understand, the Bible never says that your ancestors are watching over you right now. That's pagan ancestor worship. It's worked our way into our beliefs, and it's a sentiment that warms our heart when a loved one passes. But the Bible doesn't teach that. Never did. It says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. As Gordon put it so brilliantly with the passing of his father, we're the ones that are in the weeds. They're in heaven at the feet of Jesus, worshiping and having a far better time than watching over us. <laughs> Magic words, power words to appease God or get things from God, positive confession movement and all of that stuff, even using the name of Jesus as a power word to call upon like it's a magic phrase to get what I want. He's not a power word. He's Jesus. He's the Lord. He's the King of kings. We must change as a church all over the world. We've got to be careful with this. 
because it's constantly trying to infect the church. It's Satan bringing this stuff in, insulting it. The church now reacts more to Gallup polls than it does to the commands of Jesus. Trying to make itself acceptable to the world because it's of the false belief that it'll wink out of existence someday if we don't get squared with the world and start doing what they do and start thinking through, well, maybe we can compromise here. Maybe we can tolerate there. But I will tell you this, that Christianity, like it says in the Bible and so many demonstrations, will never be acceptable to the world. And we haven't been commissioned to try and make it so. The church will never see the world bow to God's standards. The successful church, quote unquote, in this world and according to this world's agenda and many churches' agenda, the successful church must be the one that softens its standards to make itself acceptable to the world. So many church leaders, so many Christian growth books warn that the church is out of touch with the world. Folks, I hope so. I sincerely hope so. Because only a Jezebel could ever be popular with the world that crucified Jesus Christ. So, Jesus concludes. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. And then he quotes from Psalm 2. He will rule them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like pottery. That's a messianic psalm. So what will happen when the Messiah comes and he rules? He will rule with authority. When Jesus returns, he will be a dictator. As was said in the movie Chariots of Fire by Eric Little's father, I love the line, a benign, loving dictator, but a dictator nonetheless. This is what he will be. And he says we'll rule the same way, Christians, when we're with him. I don't know what that's going to be like. But it's going to be exceedingly good, even though it sounds a little scary, because he says he will rule them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. In other words, you're going to have that too. Well, that's a whole other study, folks. But this is what Jesus said. He's no secret, he's no mystery, and you're going to rule and reign with me. And he says, I will also give him the morning star. What is that? What is the morning star? Well, some people say it's Venus. The morning star is Venus. Also, it's the evening star, depending on what time of year it is, where Venus's position in the sky is, because it orbits the sun, so we see it in different places. It was very bright. It's just merely reflecting the sun's light off of its very, very nasty clouds. But you know, it's been a puzzle to people about what that morning star is. Why would Jesus say, I will give him the morning star? And the answer as usual, is found in the Old Testament, where if you look at one of the most controversial and hated people in the Bible, Balaam, who we talked about last week, Balaam, in his fourth oracle, said something remarkable. Remember, here's a very bad man that God still chooses to speak through. God made no bones about it. He was bad. He was evil. He was wicked. But God wasn't going to let that stand in the way of getting his message out through this evil person. I like the way God works. He can use anybody in anything. In Numbers chapter 24, verse 15, Balaam, who was commissioned by Balak, the king of the Moabites, to put a curse on the people of Israel, he said this, and he couldn't help saying it. Then he uttered his oracle. The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, this is Balaam speaking, the oracle of one whose eyes see clearly. The oracle of one who hears the words of God. This is a wicked man speaking. But he can't get away from the fact that this is what is going on. Who sees a vision from the Almighty. Who falls prostrate and whose eyes are opened. Now stop right there for a second. Does that sound a little bit familiar? Isn't it exactly what happened to John when he first saw Jesus in chapter 1? It's exactly what happened. And then Balaam, wicked sinner that he was, speaking from the mouth of God himself, said this, I see him, the Messiah, but not now. I behold him. 
but not near. A star will come out of Jacob, and a scepter will rise out of Israel. The morning star, the Messiah. He's not here yet, but he is coming, which is what he just told them. I will come when I come. Hold on to what you have until I come. I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This letter was written to the angel of the church at Thyatira. Whether it was a literal angel, and again, as I said at the very beginning, we have no record in the Bible of angels overseeing churches. But it could be. It could be the pastor overseeing the church. It could be the bishop overseeing the church. It could be even someone else. But it is someone in particular that when they read this, they know who they are. And they are the one that Jesus is coming to saying, you need to fix this, church leader. You need to get with it, church leader. Jesus tells them, you just keep going in the right direction. You don't tolerate that woman Jezebel anymore or her practices. You keep the church pure. The church is Jesus in the world while he's still in heaven. Remember, we are his body. We take that in such a mystical sense, the mystical body of Christ. No, you're the arms, the legs, the toes, the, the, what, all the parts of the body. And Jesus, he was one man in one place at one time, and now he, by his spirit, lives through us. Your spirit lives in your body. You are not your body. You are your spirit. Your body is the machine God gave you. And your body does things to serve others, to serve itself at times. Now we, some total, are a body with the spirit living in it. It happens to be God's spirit and Christ's body. So what the church does in the world is Jesus in the world. How are we doing with that? How does the world perceive Jesus? That's who we are. And that which doesn't look like him, this is what he is telling the Thyatirans, simply isn't him. Is Jesus a Republican? Is he a Democrat? Is he a Buddhist? Is he among the greats? Is he whatever we perceive him to be? Is he whatever we want him to be? Is he whatever we expect him to be? Is he distant and pragmatic? Is he nonchalant about sin? No, he is what he said he is. He is who he is, glorious and immutable. His church must remain in line with his unchanging reality, or at least it needs to return and get in line with it. Or someday, he may be forced to act on the whole tragedy by saying first, they aren't mine. They don't look like me at all. You don't let this stuff into my family. I saved you out of it. That's the message to the Thyatirans. And that's the message to the church this day while we still have ears to hear. Lord, thank you for bringing us together to study your word and thank you for speaking to us. Do give us ears to hear. Give us the courage in our own lives to allow you to pare away that which you find offensive, that we would follow you. And knowing that so much grace is in there not to sin, but to experience the forgiveness of sins when we step into it. Lord, keep us safe from the enemy and keep us as your body here pure. For all the churches in the world, which is not too much to ask of you, that they would remember that you, Lord Jesus, are all to us. You are our Savior, our Lord, our Shepherd, the object of the whole universe, the subject of the whole universe. And that, Lord, you have always told the truth. You've never lied to us. And with all the things that you say against certain people and things here in your scripture, it's not to make anything worse, but to make everything better. Not just for us, 
but for the whole world that would ever have contact with us, whether they love us or not. Keep us strong in you, Lord. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen.